The MDC Alliance says it's confident that the Constitutional Court in Zimbabwe will be ready to hear its case. The opposition is disputing the results of the elections, saying that the numbers just don't add up. Zimbabweans took to the polls two weeks ago, and ZANU-PF maintained its two-thirds majority in parliament, and President Emerson Mnangangwa emerged victorious. Mnangangwa was expected to be inaugurated tomorrow, but this has been put on hold pending the constitutional court judgment. SABC News foreign editor Sophie Mokwena spoke with MDC's legal representatives outside the court. We're quite confident, but uh, it is not for us to make a determination. Our role is to argue the matter, and we're more than ready to do so. When are you back in court? Uh, we will be in court uh, uh, within the, the coming 14 days. Uh, we'll argue the matter and, and, have the, and have it determined. Have you sought the legal uh, assistance from the South African uh, Senior Counsel Dalimpofu and uh, Mugai too? Y y yes, you know, as we indicated, uh, we have a very strong legal team. Um, we have some legal minds from, from South Africa. Uh, my name's Sek, uh, Senem Sek, uh, is, is that what it is called? Uh, Dalimpofu uh, is on board, uh, Te Tembega. And uh, Toby is on is on board. Uh, a lot of other other South African uh, senior council uh, are on board on the issue. But yeah. how are you going to ensure, how are you going how are you going to ensure that they have a, a required uh, a permit to come and uh, uh, argue? No, you leave that to to us. The role that they are going to play uh, is is a role uh, that is clearly circumscribed. Whatever it is that we want them to do. Uh, they will ultimately, they will ultimately do. Would and, they be in the country? Uh, well, you will see them when they come. And then finally, what are your arguments in terms of uh, what you have uh, presented to court? Well, uh, in broad, we have gone procedural number one. Uh, we've shown that the proper procedure in our view was not adhered to in the conduct of this election, the announcement of the result and the uh, concomitant declaration. We've gone mathematical. Uh, we've shown uh, that there was a lot of number crunching, uh, figure fudging, uh, and yeah, the, the like. Uh, we have also looked at the electoral environment and how uh, it contributed to what we call a non-election which took place. Is your case based on the presidential results or even parliamentary? Well, in terms of evidence, you look at everything. Uh, there are certain discrepancies. Uh, which are notable uh, between the presidential tally and the parliamentary tally, uh, and so that is one of the issues that is going to that is going to arise, uh, surely. And and the court expects an explanation once those kinds of allegations are raised. They are they're quite serious. Uh, they are quite serious. You you see certain things um, on on our papers, uh, which will yeah, which will exercise your mind. I defended Operation Restore Legacy both in court and on national television. I defended it uh, on the basis uh, that was, in my view, sustainable at law. And after I defended that operation, nobody came to me and said, Savan, you've become a politician because you've defended Operation Restore Legacy. Now, this, those are the same people. Now that I'm re defending Chamisa, I've turned around. And I'm not saying I've become a politician because I'm defending, I'm defending Jamisa. The problem that I have with Zimbabweans is that they want to choose uh, who my clients are. And I will not let anyone do that. And when they try to threaten me, when they try to harass me, uh, they can only strengthen my resolve. I never want to back down. I've never backed down from any challenge and I will not do so. Thank you. Thank you. Meanwhile, Zimbabwean President Emerson Mnangangwa's governing ZANU-PF party says it's confident that the opposition leader Nelson Chamisa has no case after he challenged last week's election results in court. ZANU-PF's legal secretary Paul Mangwana says they have sufficient legal minds to meet the MDC squarely in court. For all I know is that uh, we have not yet been saved with those papers. Uh, yes, I've checked with the registrar of uh, the court and uh, they've confirmed that they received papers from the MDC. But uh, in terms of our laws, they must save all the respondents. And um, my president had not been saved as the, the time I was speaking to you. Uh, so yes, that is the position. 
The intention was to have the inauguration on Sunday. What's going to happen now? Well, in terms of the constitution, once an application challenging the result of the election is filed with the court, um, everything stops until the constitutional court has dealt with the matter and completed it. In terms of the court processes, what's going to happen now? If we are saved with the papers, we will then respond and then um, the constitutional court will then hear arguments within the next 10 days. MDC is confident that they are going to win the case. Um, we are quite confident that they have no basis for, 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 for challenging the, the result of the election. Um, I'm sure they are just being academic. They are also bringing in uh, legal minds from South Africa. Uh, I'm sure they can even try to bring legal minds, legal minds from Mars. They will still not win the case. We don't care where they import legal minds. Uh, the case is simple and full stop. President Mnangagwa was duly elected and he won the election fairly and squarely. So we don't mind where they are going to import lawyers. Uh, Zimbabwe, we as ZANPF, we have sufficient legal minds to deal with them uh, on any point of law they can raise or points of fact they raise. President Mnangagwa earlier on indicated that he is willing to engage the opposition. He has always been willing to engage them, but not necessarily to share power, but to engage them if there is anything we require to talk about. And um, he, he, his door has always been open. The decision by the Americans to impose sanctions, have you looked at that as ZANU-PF? Well, yeah, of course. Sanctions have always been unfairly imposed on our country since 2001. We thought that the Americans were going to, 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 I mean, to, to cancel the, the sanctions. But uh, unfortunately, they've decided to unfairly and wrongfully impose the sanctions. We think this is a, a political way of interfering in our domestic policies. Uh, they should allow us to move on with our country um, and uh, deal with our challenges. We want to, to normalize the relations with the Americans. We have never had a dispute with the Americans. We have had a dispute with the British. We are talking to the British and uh, the British have been engaging us. We don't see the reason why the Americans should take the lead. They have never colonized us. They have never had a land problem with us. They should not buy this story. They are just hiding under the figure that, uh, they are, that they are no, there is no democracy in our country. But they are acknowledging that we had free and fair elections. So we don't see the reason why we should be under sanctions. The security establishment in terms of army and the police, are they uh, perhaps in sync with what President Mnangagwa is up to currently to do things differently? Yes, certainly. The, uh, President Umnangagwa is doing things differently. He's engaging everybody who wants this country to move on. The, the security establishment has a responsibility to maintain law and order in this country, to defend the sovereignty of this country. And they are doing just exactly that. The relations between the president and the vice president, some are saying that uh, the relations are frosty. That is a figment of people's imagination. The relationship between my two leaders is perfect. They are very good friends and they are working together and they are running this country to the best of their abilities. People would want to see a difference which does not exist. Those two gentlemen are very, very good friends in office and out of the office. Are you really confident that the two will work together? I'm talking about President Mnangagwa and uh, Vice President Chiwenga. They've always worked together and they work together for the good of our country. All right, let's now cross live to my colleague who's currently in Zimbabwe, Peter Ndoro. Peter, a very good morning to you. Do tell us, I mean, we're hearing that the ZANU-PF says that the MDC has no case and they are willing to meet them squarely when they come to court. What is the mood like, especially since, of course, the inauguration has also been put off? Alicia, thanks very much indeed. Yeah, it's uh, a Saturday morning at the center of Harare right now. The sun is out and Zimbabweans do what they do. They literally just get on with life. It's hard to imagine or, or it's, uh, think that when you look around that uh, such uh, political uh, developments are taking place, uh, they're just getting on with their lives. It's an ordinary Saturday morning. And as you say, this inauguration is off as a result of the petition that the MDC filed yesterday at the Constitution 
Constitutional Court, uh, hoping to have the results of the July 30 election annulled. But uh, what are the implications of uh, what happened in court yesterday and this petition? To help us unpack that a little bit, I'm now joined by a Zimbabwean lawyer and uh, independent p p politician, advocate Fadzai Mahere. Thanks so much for joining us. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Peter. All right. Uh, in layman's terms, what happened in court yesterday? So yesterday they filed the papers that are going to be the, the backbone of their challenge to the presidential um, election outcome that was announced uh, following the election on the 30th of July. What happens now? There were, I think, 25 respondents named in that uh, a petition. Um, what, what, what did the court decide? What happens to those respondents? So the court hasn't decided anything yet. All that took place yesterday was the formal lodging of the papers with the court. The number of respondents shouldn't concern you. All it is is every single presidential candidate, together with, uh, I'm guessing, the electoral management body, ZEC, the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, and po possibly the chief elections officer there too. Every presidential candidate is an interested party uh, in a presidential election petition because they've got an interest in the outcome, as it were. Most of them are very unlikely to have something to say. I think the two key respondents, the two key players, will certainly be uh, President Emerson Nangagwa and the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission uh, and its chairperson. So Zimbabwean citizens, what does it mean for them? It's the last glimmer of hope. <laughs> I think, you know, some people hold some optimism that, you know, the court will intervene because there are some very glaring irregularities that attach to the manner in which, you know, various aspects of the election were, were conducted from, you know, the before, the during, the after. A lot of things have been cited in that application. I did peruse it yesterday. Uh, so Zimbabweans are hoping, and I think that hope stems from the fact that, you know, our court does have very wide powers in an application of this nature from Section 93, the court can go as far as declaring a winner. So the court could come out of that application theoretically saying Nelson Chamisa is the guy. The court could say, you know, the entire election was invalid, start again within 60 days. And the court can actually come up with some other order altogether. Those are the wide powers the court has in terms of Section 93. And I think that's where the hope comes from. And I think, uh, you know, what, what Zimbabweans are hanging on to at the moment is just the last bit of fight they believe they can have because the constitution and, you know, elections are the only way we can change a government uh, lawfully and properly. So I I think people are holding on to this because, you know, the fear of another five years of the same is looming large. So uh, you, you talk about uh, the white powers that the Constitutional Court has. Um, you know, I, I was an auditor one time in my life, and one of the things that used to be big is materiality. And so would they be considering, or what would they be considering, is um, these discrepancies, whatever they are, would they have had a material effect on the result or is that something they don't worry about? They just say procedures weren't followed, it doesn't matter what the result was. No, I think they will look at everything and I think our electoral law goes is pretty deep and so I mean there are all sorts of safeguards uh, that have to be complied with. You start with the constitution itself which requires that the electoral process be transparent, uh, be verifiable, be free, be fair and also that all candidates participating have reasonable access to all material including things like the ballot paper which we all saw did not happen. Uh, the law, the constitution requires I think under section 61, that the media, the state media, give everyone a fair chance. All of that plays into fairness. And then in terms of the actual strict procedures, you know, the counting, the, the, da the data, the stats, the numbers, all of that has to add up. So I think the court does have wide powers. They don't just look, it's not um, a, a window dressing exercise, or at least it shouldn't be a window dressing exercise, going through the motion ticking boxes and saying, okay, it's done and dusted. There's nothing we can do. I think this is a real test for for our, you know, electoral law and the, the constitutional court, whether it will invoke the wide powers that the constitution gives to it. So there have been concerns in the past about the independence of ju ju the judiciary uh, upon which the constitutional court is a part. And, I, and the question is, as a practicing advocate, have you seen an, a strengthening of the uh, judicial independence over time? Um, 
absolutely. I mean, we win cases every single day in these courts. So certainly there is a hope that the courts will be independent. Um, I think without any evidence that they won't be, I think we shouldn't jump to the conclusion or hang on to a speculation that they won't. Let's see how they handle and manage this case and then we can deduce from there. And this 14 days, that's stipulated by the Constitution? Correct. That's in Section 93, I believe it is, of the Constitution. They've got 14 days, starting from today, we count, to hear the application, to take in you know, any uh, you know, evidence that the other side, the opposing party, ZEG, the president, other presidential candidates, have to say in opposition to what uh, Mr. Chamisa has raised, uh, an opportunity for legal argument uh, to be written down, and then oral argument to be presented, and then the court has to to also hand down its determination, its judgment. So everything has to happen within 14 days. All right, so whose responsibility is it to inform the respondents that they are um, mentioned in this uh, uh, application and serving of notices? In terms of, great question, <laughs> in terms of Rule uh, 23, I believe it is, of the Constitutional Court rules, um, the applicant, uh, so Mr. Chimisa, has an obligation to uh, file with the courts these papers and to serve, in other words, to deliver physically uh, these papers to all the respondents concerned. So that obligation, that onus rests on Mr. Chamisa, and he has to do it within the seven-day period. So yesterday was his last day uh, to do it. So I'm sure all of them are on formal notice uh, if Mr. Chamisa has done all his work, if his lawyers have done what they're supposed to do, they must be on formal notice that, you know, this application is now pending. So can, if, if one of the people refuse to receive this notice, what happens then? I think the law is quite clear, you know, um, the deputy sheriff or whoever it is who goes to serve it just endorses that, you know, Mr. X refused to take the papers. So if I've got a case against you, Peter, and I'm, I want to claim a million dollars that you owe me, you can't just say I don't want the summons. It doesn't work like that. You have an obligation to receive it, and if you, or, or it could be delivered into your letterbox or something that will make sure that you get notice of the papers. And if you refuse to do it, it's endorsed and it just proceeds um, as if you were served. So you can't play those sort of games in an application like that. A this. couple of things just to wind up. The first one, Tendai BT uh, being... Uh, extradited, or not extradited, deported from Zambia. Do you think the Zambian authorities under international law have a case to answer there? I think before we even go into international law, we look at their own courts. There's a high court order from the high court of Zambia that the Zambian authorities completely disregarded. So that says something about their own rule of law before we go to international refugee law, which they obviously did flout. And I think the UNHCR did issue a statement saying, you know, what are you doing here? I think it's a matter of regret that, you know, a, a sadic country, a country where, you know, you're supposed to respect not only fundamental rights, the dignity of a person, the manner in which he was treated, the fact that a court order was disrespected, all of it doesn't bode well for the sort of, you know, continent and region we want to build. And then the last question, an interesting one. The uh, president-elect uh, tweeted yesterday or the day before saying, at my intervention, Tendai Beauty was released. And I'm just wondering, even though it was a, a, a positive outcome for Tendai Beauty, is this outside of a state of emergency uh, an executive overreach? I think there is absolutely no constitutional basis for the president or anyone else to intervene in a formal legal process. Tendai Beatty was brought before a court having been charged with two offences. There is no role for the president there in terms of the constitution which binds all of us, including the head of state. He doesn't get to call the magistrate or prosecutors. And by the way, the National Prosecution, prosecution Authority also has a constitutional obligation to be independent. The president doesn't get to pull strings for people and say, I intervened. So, I mean, that's a complete breach of, you know, independence of the judiciary, independence of the prosecution service. And I think it's disappointing that we have this, you know, tendency. I'm not sure what the aim of the president's tweet in that regard was, but it definitely does undermine public confidence in the judicial system. All right, Fadzai, we're going to have to leave it there, but thanks very much indeed for your thoughts. Peter, thank you very much.
All right, and that's where we're going to leave our conversation with Advocate uh, Fadzai Mahere, who is uh, giving us uh, her take on the uh, constitutional process that's underway at the moment, uh, this uh, petition that was filed by the MDC Alliance to have the results of the elections of uh, 30 July annulled. And uh, we'll keep on top of that story, but uh, I guess the big story really is that there are 14 days to make a decision and there'll be no inauguration taking place tomorrow. Back to you, Alicia. Thank you so much to Peter Ndoro there out in Harare and absolutely there he was joined by a Zim constitutional uh, law expert there and she did say this will be a real test uh, for the Zim constitutional law and as you heard from Peter Ndoro there, uh, the both parties have 14 days to hear uh, and make the ruling as well as of course uh, the court can also nullify uh, these results and call for fresh elections to be run in 60 days.